Good afternoon and a warm welcome to this AHDB Potatoes webinar. It's really fantastic to have uh, so many of you uh, join us from across the UK and, and abroad as well. My name is Laura Bouvet. I'm Knowledge and Innovation Facilitator at AHDB and I'm responsible for knowledge exchange in potato storage. So for, for those of you new to the AHDB Potatoes webinars, we've tackled a, a couple of important storage uh, issues so far in, in these webinars this month, such as uh, store cleaning uh, at the beginning of the month, uh, and we've also looked at alternative sprout suppressants for the processing market. But uh, the focus of, of today is a uh, sprout control for the fresh market and um, post CIPC. So just before uh, we move along, just a bit of housekeeping uh, before we move on to the programme of the day. So for the purpose of this webinar, you're all on uh, mute and your, and your cameras are off. So um, even though we might not be able to see you or, or hear you, please do, do, engage with, do engage with us throughout the event by uh, asking uh, questions via the questions box which uh, you should be able to find on the right hand side of your uh, of your screen. Uh, and if you have any technical uh, issues, this is uh, this questions box is also the place to um, um, uh, to get those in. And one of my colleagues will will be able to help you out with those. So we're together for an hour and on a fairly tight schedule. But um, the way we'll we'll run through things is that we'll we'll hear from from our speakers in the first instance in the first half hour or so, and then we'll have the rest of the uh, the rest of the webinar to go into a bit more uh, depth uh, around the topic of the day with the Q and A uh, session. There are bases and Narosa points available uh, for you, so you should have been, a been able to um, enter these details and during the registration process. Um, but if for any reason that hasn't worked, again, please use the question box to submit your, your details and, and we'll, take care, uh, we'll take care of the rest. So the webinar will be uh, recorded and will be made um, available to you uh, via a, a link. You'll get a link sen sent over uh, shortly after uh, after the session, and the link will also be available on on our YouTube channel and the AHTB website. And of course, please uh, engage with us, and you know, not just through the questions, but uh, through uh, Twitter as well on the social media channels. So the program um, of the day is that we'll be kicking things off with the uh, malic hydroside. So as many of you will know, it's you know it's used as a as a for volatile control, but it's also an effective sprout suppressant, um, provided there are uh, sufficient residue levels in in tubers. So Andy Alexander, uh, independent potato agronomist, uh, will will give us a rundown of. Uh, uh, of those measures to help get the best out of um, MH application this season. Um, then after this, uh, we have a number of storage trials ongoing at Sutton Bridge looking into alternatives to, uh, to CIPC for sprout control. So uh, Glyn Harper, um, senior crop scientist at Sutton Bridge, will give us an overview uh, uh, of those uh, findings um, in the context of, uh, of the fresh market. And finally, we'll have uh, Adrian uh, Cunnington, head of, head of Sutton Bridge Crop Storage Research, uh, who will give us a run through how to put those findings into practice and what to um, take into account with regards to store uh, management to get the best out of those uh, alternative options. So really what we'd like to for you to take away um, after this webinar uh, two things. Um, one of them is to find out about the current availability of sprout suppressants. It's been quite a, um, a dynamic uh, landscape and, and things are changing so you'll get to, to, to hear the latest uh, on that and what the what the effectiveness is of those uh, sprout suppressants again in the context of of the fresh market and secondly uh, you know for you to learn about how these alternatives work based uh, on the work carried out at, at Sutton Bridge and what sort of best practice measures uh, can be uh, can be implemented for um, uh, for efficacy so without further ado, I'll, uh, um, I'll introduce you to Andy Alexander to talk to us about um, MH. Over to you, Andy. 
Uh, thank you and good afternoon to everybody. Planning to store potatoes without CIPC. That was my sort of leading headline. Um, and it's slightly different ball game for the fresh sector to the processing sector. Uh, but nevertheless, we still have to instigate sprout control. MH, or malic hydroside, has been around for quite a long time. Well, I first used it, and I reckoned it must have been 25 years ago. Um, I used it for sprout, uh, for volunteer control because we had CIPC and other products to deal with sprout control. And I was quite flexible on rates. In the fresh sector, you do have temperature control to help with uh, sprouting in store. But um, I know that if you run them too low, you can affect the cookability of the uh, potatoes. So um, we need to instigate some form of chemical sprout control. And I'm just going to tell you how I think we can get the best out of MH. It is a, a, it's a chemical that's applied to the growing crop. It's not a chemical that we put into the stores themselves. So it has to be a translocating systemic type chemical. Sprout control is important because it uh, stops weight loss, it stops distortion in samples, and retailers don't like to see it anyway. But MH needs good, very good management to get the best out of it. And I'm just going to try and indicate some of the things that is so important. It needs to be on a grown crop, not a stress crop. I add, not a stress crop. It has to be on a crop that will um, conduct the chemical right through into the tubers. Very important that to be like that. However, you must all make sure before you apply it that the crop has achieved its quality status, size, etc. Because anything under 25 mil um, will become non effective. I think I think um, the first thing you have to try and remember, which I find a lot of people struggle with, and for best results, is to have six weeks, six weeks after applying the chemical to desiccation. Just give it a chance, as it's working all the time. And with that, the weather factor is key to get the best. So I will also add, you should check with your end buyers that they're happy with using MH. Most of them are nowadays, but we did have a period when um, there were some difficulties, certainly with some of the retailers. But the weather conditions are key. The best results, you need 24 hours dry, temperatures above 26 degrees. Best in overcast time. Full rate, manufacturer's recommendation rate for the product. Do not tank mix, although this may change in time when we have some better knowledge. But the key factor is 400 to 450 liters of water. And nowadays, any of the waste when you're grading out can go for stock feed, whereas there was a session of typically. I suggest spraying in the early morning or late at night. It will help with volunteer control. Also, chain tuberization and second growth. So a lot of the product, some people say it's pricey, um, but you know, you can get a lot out of it if you use it correctly. Read the label carefully. Some products have 
mass number changes. I know it's a busy time of year on the farms when we're applying this, but I repeat, the best results, attention to detail. Overcast weather, 24 hours dry, above 26 degrees, no rain. And if you tick all those boxes, you should have a good result. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, for those uh, practical tips on maximi maximizing um, MH uptake. Uh, so it's my pleasure now to introduce you to, uh, to Glyn, who will be taking us through uh, sprout control um, post CIPC for the, for the fresh market. Over to you, Glyn. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for that introduction, Laura. Um, next, next slide, please. So I, what I'm going to talk about here are three factors that impact on uh, quality of potato during storage, in particular sprouting. And you can see them there as chemical treatment, uh, store temperature and variety. Next. Hopefully you can see this uh, fairly clearly. Um, you'll see a range of different active substances there uh, in the uh, absence of CIPC those that are available to us in GB are maleic hydrazide, chlorprofam, spearmint and ethylene with a couple of the others waiting in the wings uh, for various decisions to be made. So for the purposes of the trial that I'm about to talk about we've taken those uh, suppressants that are available uh, and a couple of the others that are waiting in the wings and trial those with uh, uh, alone and in combination. Uh, next slide please. So this is the outline of the trial. There are four varieties, uh, all, all in the top 20 of the UK varieties. Uh, and of differing dormancy, which is important. There's a the field treatment of with and without maleic hydrazide, um, and we've found growers that will supply the, the, the four varieties, and they generously allowed us to cover part of the field with plastic while MH treatment was uh, going on. And after an hour, an hour or two after MH was applied, we could remove the plastic and the plants would then be uh, treated as, as the normal rest of the field. Uh, we hand harvested them, so we could hand harvest adjacent plots that had MH free or with MH. We would net the samples and bury them in the, in the box, within a ton box, uh, covered with a bulk crop of some description. So in each store we would have six tons uh, and there would be various replicates, uh, replications of, of the nets within that, within that store. We assessed every three months or so, up to nine months, and the assessments were for sprout length and weight, um, weight loss and shelf life sprouting as well. Next slide, please. Well, this, this is probably quite difficult to see. Uh, at the top is just simply the week number of the year. And it's really just to show, uh, give an, a schema for the, the important uh, timings of, of treatments and sampling occasions. Uh, you can see on the left, top left hand side, we were harvesting in late September storing from early October and the different colours of the treatments that uh, that I've shown uh, those are the different uh, treatments so they were spaced out to, to provide harvest intervals and to provide uh, intervals as suggested by the um, by the label all the treatments were applied as per label and you can see the four treatments that I'm going to talk about uh, in the rest of the trial um, uh, there below. So spearmint oil, DMN and CIPC and ethylene. 
and we've used label recommendations and we've used as much as we can. In part, we've used as much as we can is because when we buried those nets within a box, we can't see them. And so we're, we're flying, not slight, just very slightly blind, but we're just conscious that we have to treat the crop for the worst possible dormancy or for the a variety that's likely to sprout the most. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to describe results from the first year of the trial. The, the second year's work is still in progress. I'm only showing uh, some selected treatments, but all of the, the the entirety of the trial is available as a report from the AHDB website. And I'm also only going to show you the results after the nine month storage. So when the maximum amount of storage uh, of sprouting is, is um, on the tubers. Next slide, please. So this is purely showing the effects of MH treatment on sprouting. So we've got the four varieties and with and without MH and no other treatment. So this is after nine months storage at four and a half degrees, which is you know pushing the boundary of uh, temperature for fresh pack storage. Uh, they the range of MH was from nine to seventeen mg, so you know reasonable. And you can clearly see how how much of an impact MH has had even after nine months on the sprouting of those those varieties. As you can see, Edward and Piper are pretty uh, sprouty. Nectar and Melody are relatively dormant. So MH here is, is really being very helpful in providing sprout control. Next slide, please. This is a Maris Piper, so a, a less dormant variety. And I'm showing you purely the, the MH free treatments here. If you wanted to see the MH in combination with these treatments, again, that's available in the report that I mentioned. So after nine months storage, you can see untreated has got uh, is pretty sprouty. Uh, but those other four treatments are all well, ethylene, Bioxm, and DMN are having a really good effect. Bioxm and DMN are having a spectacular effect in the absence of MH. Uh, next slide, please. So nectar is uh, a, a more dormant variety, and you can see the sprout length here is only four or five millimeters. Again, uh, um, the treatments all have an effect. There's a little bit uh, doesn't look quite as good as it does in the Maris Piper. In part, that's because the Maris Piper y-axis scale was up to 25. But you can clearly see that uh, DMN in particular, but Biox and ethylene are having good levels of control in the absence of MH at nine months at four and a half degrees. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the assessments was sprouting during shelf life. So for this, we take the take a replicate the nets and we store them at 12 degrees C for 12 days. So it's, it's a, you know, a reasonably challenging shelf life. You can see on the left hand side, the bars on the left hand side is where it's MH free and those on the right hand side where MH, uh, the, the tubers were treated with MH. And clearly, if you compare the untreated, you can actually see MH still has a residual activity during shelf life, even after the nine month storage. If you then combine that with something else, so Biox or DMN, you get really very effective sprout control during that period. I have to mention that with DMN, this is uh, this has followed a harvest interval the recommended harvest interval of 30 days. So there's still residual DMN there that we can see that's working in conjunction with MH. Next slide, please. So MH provided long lasting effective sprout suppression. 
uh, Bioxem and DMN were independently uh, both effective and, or highly effective sprout suppression, uh, suppressants under the trial conditions. Overall, DMN was the best of the treatments that we tried. The UK, or I should say GB really, NH and for example, Bioxem could provide long-term sprout control options. NH and to some extent, the other sprout suppression, suppressants, including 1,4-DMN, uh, appear to provide continuing sprout control during shelf life, which is going to be very helpful. Next slide, please. So the the second uh, sort of factor in terms of the uh, sprout control that I wanted to talk to you about was varietal dormancy. Um, and the the is it possible to improve sprout control and reduce costs by using equivalent but longer dormant varieties? Uh, and so for this experiment, we taken common seed stocks of 40 varieties that were planted at both spot north and spot west. Um, they were hand harvested and then 50 tubers of each variety were stored at 15 degrees C at Sutton Bridge. So again, we're challenging the, the, the dormancy here. And we assess sprout length on a weekly basis. We've taken dormancy as the time from tuber initiation or our estimate of it to when 50% of the tubers had sprouts of three millimeter in the store. Next slide, please. So <laughs> there'll be prizes if you can read any of that. This is really just to illustrate the, the 40 varieties and the, the relative dormancies that they each have. And as you can see, it's a continuum and it's actually rather hard to to think of what would be a sort of significant or suitable ranking arrangement for these, uh, you know, if you wanted to cluster them into groups. But they, they range in dormancy at 15 degrees C over getting on for 100 days. So, um, so that's a significant range of, of dormancies. Next slide, please. So this is a bit slightly easier to understand than perhaps. So this is the relative dormancy of some of the fresh pack varieties. Actually, I think it's practically all of the fresh pack varieties that were in the trial at that time. On the left hand side, you can just see a line, a, a, a column of numbers, which is the, the dormancy duration. Uh, and each row is about te is 10 days. So you can see if you took Melody, uh, which is the uh, about the fourth row down and, and compared it to Mozart, seventh row down, there would be a difference of about 30 days at 15 degrees C. So, for example, if it was a suitable exchange, you could use Mozart instead of Melody and, and garner an extra 30 days dormancy in the store. Uh, so this work is still ongoing. Um, and uh, it's in, now in its third year. And the report for this will be available on the AHDB website very shortly. Next slide, please. As Andy mentioned, we can also use store temperature to control sprouting. Uh, obviously, there are, there's a cost benefit to that. The, the cooler you have it, uh, the better you can control sprouting, but the, you start to perhaps bring in some uh, downsides in terms of cooking or, or uh, perhaps disease development and um, cost implications. The warmer you have it, the more the sprouting is going to occur. So there's going to be a cost consideration here. But generally, the lower you have the temperature, the, the more you can control sprouting. So that's reasonably evident. Next slide, please. So, 
So I've outlined sort of three factors to do with uh, chemical control, the variety and the storage temperature. That, and Andy has outlined the use, how to practically apply MH for the best effect. But, but I think it would be a mistake to concentrate on any of those things because almost the, the critical thing is how you set up your store. So store setup and management is absolutely key. There's no point in having the best sprout suppressant program if uh, if you can't control the temperature or you've stacked the boxes so that uh, air is not circulating. So this is really a, this pamphlet here, this guide, it covers all the bases in terms of store managers. I would thoroughly recommend that as a as the basis. Um, for your storage uh, planning for the next season. Uh, and I think that, uh, next slide please. Okay, so yeah, that is the end of it. So just to go back, that previous guide, I think we will now hear from Adrian Cunnington um, as, as to how aspects of that guide actually uh, work with some of the sprout suppressants that we've been talking about. So thank you. Thank you, Glenn, for this uh, comprehensive overview of the, the research ongoing on Sutton Bridge. Um, I think it's quite clear from the, the work that you've presented that um, it's, and you touched on it at the end, it's not just about the sprout suppressants um, available, it's uh, in other options as well in taking an, an integrated approach, um, yeah. which I think leads on, leads on nicely into um, Adrian Cunnington's um, presentation. Um, so, Adrian, over to you. The, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Laura. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just as I start, perhaps I could just remind everyone to feed in your questions so we have plenty of questions for the Q&A uh, session. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of those points that uh, Glyn has just touched on in, in relation to integrated store management. Um, and I'm, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to start by returning to Glyn's summary. Um, so this uh, illustrates the situation we have currently. Um, at the top, the green ticks for 2020, malic hydroside, which we've heard from Andy about, um, spearmint oil and ethylene. Those are our three um, options at the moment. And if I can have the next slide, please. Um, and I just want to um, point out to you that uh, in relation to malic hydroside, we have produced at Sutton Bridge a uh, research review for malic hydroside use as a sprout suppressant, and uh, that's available on the website. Um, and an interesting um, piece of data in that review is that we need to be achieving at least 12 mg per kilo of malic hydroside in the tuber to ensure that we get uh, effective uh, sprout control. So that comes back to some of those factors that Andy was talking about, timing and getting the right uh, uh, conditions for application to ensure that we've got that residual um, level at, the, uh, at least 12 mg to uh, give us uh, adequate control in storage. Um, so uh, if I have the next slide, please. Um, so this is just going back to that, um, that summary. And I just want to touch on one or two of the other chemicals on here. Um, in addition, and um, in particular, dimethyl naphthalene, uh, you'll see that we have a question mark under that for 2020. Um, just want to mention that the HDB is currently involved in an emergency application uh, for approval of DMN um, and that has gone into CRD. Um, I think we will get only a limited amount of, oops I've lost my slides, I don't know where they've gone. Um, I think the AHDB will only get a limited amount of um, um, approval for DMN if we get any at all, there are no guarantees and therefore um, 
I think um, uh, we have got to wait and see whether or not that will be available next season and what the priorities uh, will be that are given to it. But uh, um, I wanted you to be aware of that. I also wanted to mention that uh, we are getting some movement on orange oil. Um, orange oil, um, <clears throat> that's uh, now got uh, some approval in, in the Netherlands. Um, so that's uh, um, going to probably come on the market in 2021 and will be targeted at the fresh market uh, as a, as a uh, uh, first stop. And then uh, also worth mentioning Three Deck and Two Own, which is another um, active coming from the US. Um, that's unlikely to get uh, clearance in uh, the next two years. Uh, we're looking at 2022 as a possible date for uh, three deck and two own to be uh, become available. So on the horizon, it looks good, uh, but for now we've got to concentrate on those uh, three green ticks, and um, that means we've got a, a lot to do to get the best out of those particular chemicals. And it's worth just reminding everybody that CI CIPC approval and use ends this season. Um, there is no approval um, any longer, so we uh, have to uh, now concentrate on managing the legacy of that chemical. We must clean up any treated stores before we use them this year uh, because the, we are going to be uh, required to do so to uh, achieve a temporary MRL. Um, now, that temporary MRL is important because we've got a lot of stores that have got residual CIPC within them and uh, even if we do clean them very thoroughly, we will still get traces of CIPC and we need to be able to uh, still sell our crop with the uh, um, adherence to the, um, to the uh, MRL. And it's likely that there will be some significant sampling taking place uh, to demonstrate that adherence in order to uh, make sure that the temporary MRL can be maintained for a, a few years. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, when we get down to the building itself, um, that's an important facet that we need to consider is, is leakage. Um, it's much more important with volatiles and gases and essentially on, with those chemicals I've just talked about, with the exception of uh, monoxide hydroside, we're dealing with volatiles and gases. So stores must be well sealed and there are various ways we might be able to do do that we can uh, possibly um, top up insulation. Uh, spray foam is particularly effective at sealing um, the uh, building, um, and it may even help with some CIPC mitigation by uh, uh, sealing some of the uh, CIPC into the in, into the uh, into the foam. Um, we do know that it's, it exists just in in the surface, but that's not an excuse for not cleaning. Uh, in the first place. The other thing we can do is to look at uh, pressurized leakage tests, uh, something called an AP50 test using the equipment in the uh, photograph there. Um, this puts a, a small amount of pressure onto a building and by measuring how that pressure dissipates, we can assess the, the level of leakage. Uh, this is a service we do run from Sutton Bridge. Um, at the moment, um, we have been limited in what we're being able to do due to COVID-19, but uh, I'm hopeful that we will be able to uh, uh, roll out more tests in, this, in, in the near future. Uh, the other aspect of leakage to think about are the louvers and doors. Uh, they are uh, inadequate in many stores, um, and therefore we need to take uh, action to try to improve uh, the way that they uh, these louvers and doors seal. Um, that might be uh, simple tasks such as adjustments, which could be carried out uh, on farm, um, or we may need to upgrade. And uh, uh, if, for example, you were thinking of upgrading louvers, um, then maybe consider replacing vein louvers with um, the um, panel door type uh, um, ventilation. Um, so that we can uh, get better sealing. Now, um, it, one other factor to think about in, in relation to that, uh, and certainly in this season, is that there are uh, fewer engineers available due to um, 
the COVID-19 situation, uh, I think uh, we are going to see some easing of that now, but uh, there definitely have been uh, issues with getting uh, engineers to site, um, understandably, given uh, the problems that we've, that we've all had. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, still waiting on the next slide. Um, it's going to be on store loading. Um, so management of the crop in store really is what we're talking about here. And if we're loading the store, then um, these volatile alternatives will need um, managing carefully. We need to be able to get uh, the alternative in contact with the crop to get effective use of it. But we also need to be able to keep it in the store, hence the issue on leakage. And we need to be able to maximize the uh, impact of that uh, alternative um, in terms of its sprout control. So full stores are best for optimizing efficacy. And if we have part filled stores, either when loading or even unloading, um, if you put an extended unloading period as part of your marketing, then that effect will be diluted. And that has been a, a discussion point. And I have been talking to one or two of the um, approval holders about this. And um, certainly for mint oil, Juno uh, Plant Protection, who um, sell that product, advise extending the store closure period beyond the 48 hours, which is now on the label. So um, that is a, uh, a factor that we need to uh, uh, think about if we are you know, dealing with part filled stores. We might need to close the stores uh, for longer. The slow speed recirculation is also important um, to ensure that the active penetrates through the crop. So all of those fans that you've uh, bought to improve your CIPC uh, performance are still going to be valuable in making these alternatives work. Uh, we need to be able to get um, the chemical through the crop. And those fans are also ex uh, extremely important in making sure that uh, we even out the temperatures um, before application uh, to avoid any problems with condensation because condensation will uh, inevitably um, cause uh, uneven distribution of, of any chemical and uh, the new ones are uh, just as vulnerable to that problem. Next slide please. Um, so uh, one or two other points uh, on store control. Um, it's just trying to pick out the, the factors that we're going to have to think about in terms of um, our control logic and our prioritization using these new chemicals. It's not going to necessarily be just business as usual as it was with uh, uh, CIPC. Um, I think there's going to be a need to um, perhaps change the uh, level of priority uh, between ambient air and fridge with more emphasis on the latter. Um, especially for pull down and, and the March to May period. And I, I appreciate that's not necessarily going to be easy for everybody, but uh, uh, I do think if you are in those uh, uh, more vulnerable areas um, where we can't keep temperature under control, then uh, what we don't want to have to do is spend a fortune on uh, alternative chemicals to uh, try and get control of sprouting. We need to use uh, all the tools in the toolbox and a fridge, even a second hand one, could be very useful. We need to think about how we operate uh, some of the, uh, the systems in the store. So, for example, the ethylene generators, uh, they will interlink with uh, the louver systems in most stores so that uh, if the louver is open, the generator goes off. So we're not generating uh, um, ethylene that's just going straight out of the store. And we're going to need to look at the uh, flushing protocols and settings, um, carbon dioxide control. Um, in some of the fridge doors, can we use um, techniques such as bleeding uh, ambient air into the into the fridge airflow uh, to bring in some fresh air at um, uh, relatively low volumes, but uh, nevertheless get ambient air with, into the store uh, while the stores are running um, for temperature control. Um, or do we need to run things like dedicated low level carbon dioxide extractors and uh, low level because 
carbon dioxide is heavier than air. All of these uh, questions are still there to be answered, um, and we do need to um, take some time to uh, try to prioritise um, which of these options we need to, to use. Next slide, please. And that's um, going to be on costs. So uh, this is an important aspect of, of uh, the new regimes. Most of the alternatives are round about four times more expensive than uh, CIPC, certainly if they're applied post-harvest. Um, and uh, we do need to consider all those factors I've, I've been talking about and others to reduce reliance on chemical. That will be uh, quite key. Um, so factors such as Lynn has touched on, dormancy, um, temperature and uniformity, keeping the active in the store. Timing and application will be critical to maximise efficacy. Each, each dose needs to do its uh, maximum uh, possible job, best possible job. And we have to be aware that seasonal pressures could still increase the frequency of use beyond uh, some of the regimes that we've used in, in trials. Uh, we all know of those years where we've had to have an extra dose um, of, uh, for that bit of control, probably some premature sprouting, things like that. And, and, and that's all fairly uncharted uh, territory at the moment. Now, I've just put, uh, next slide please, I've put together some uh, scenarios and some approximate costs per tonne. Um, these are indicative and not cast in stone. Um, but I just wanted to uh, feed these into a grid, which is on the next slide, please, uh, just to show uh, some of the typical uh, costs per tonne that we're going to be looking at with some of these um, uh, different regimes. And for um, the packing market, I, I still think that um, in many cases we will be uh, not very different from, from the current um costs I, I, I put to illustrate um this i put a uh, a current fridge plus one dose of cipc at, at the top and uh, then i'm comparing it with a number of different regimes um possibly if you if you're doing um farm gate sales or, or bag trade sales then maybe you'll be uh, running relatively warm and you might be able to use malate hydroside and possibly even a couple of doses of mint um, or even DMN if that became available. Um, and then uh, in other cases, you may be using fridge plus ethylene, um, which is uh, certainly very effective if we've got ethylene sensitive varieties, um, a little bit riskier if you're not sure on ethylene sensitivity. And we do have a trial running at Sutton Bridge looking at the sensitivity of a number of different varieties, which uh, we haven't reported today, but will be being reported um, fairly soon. Um, it's just come out of store. And then uh, further down the page, I've illustrated some uh, uh, regimes using colder temperatures, um, maybe using a bit of um, malic hydroside or a dose of mint, um, or even chemical free, um, which I know a lot of you will be running perhaps two to three degrees, fridge only. Um, and there is no reason why that, that obviously can't continue. Perhaps a better long-term option is for those long dormancy varieties that Glyn was touching on, uh, to allow us to uh, store a little bit warmer, four or five degrees, where we have a lower risk of problems such as acrylamide. And we're also looking at some, uh, some lower costs. So, a number of different options there to, to consider and uh, think about uh, going forward. Next slide, please. So uh, just to finish off, I just want to mention how AHDB can help if you've got any issues with your uh, um, sprout suppression. We are, or any other factor of, uh, to do with your store management. We are running the storage network, uh, which you can, uh, gain access to on that telephone number shown there. Free one-to-one -one visits to your store, discussion of options for your business, and we'll do an analysis on, um, simple analysis, color-coded such as the one on the right there, and um, 
talk through all these different aspects of the integrated approach to storage, which will be so crucial going forward. The service was suspended due to COVID, but we will be restarting on the 6th of July. So I'm pleased to uh, be able to uh, tell you that today. And then finally, next slide, please. It's, this is just a reminder that we do need to be CIPC free, not apply CIPC at 20, the 2020 store loading. Um, and that will all enable us to uh, uh, comply with the needs for a temporary MRL, which we're going to need going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian, for this um, uh, really good overview of, uh, of the importance, really, of store management to, to make those alternative to CIPC uh, um, uh, work. If I could uh, ask Glenn and uh, and Andy to to join us, and and we'll move on to uh, to the Q and A session. So thank you very much, everybody, for for feeding in uh, feeding in your questions. And uh, we've had um, we've had a couple come in on on dormancy. So um, I think this one's for for, for you, Glenn. Uh, question on. Uh, dormancy um, and in specifically whether or what was the difference between the two stocks of Morris Piper uh, in the dormancy ranking that uh, that you showed? Sorry, the, uh, the dormancy ranking of Maris Piper? Uh, there were two stocks of um, Morris Piper within the trial. I, no, I don't think there were. Okay, perhaps we'll move on to. Um, yeah. We did have the questions on 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 dormancy and um, and in relation specifically to the dormancy break and how how that was um, assessed. Um, is the estimate of um, tube initiation sufficiently um, accurate and? Um, and perhaps a bit more detail around the seed stocks that um, that were used. I imagine within the trials there um, there can be several uh, variables that could be uh, confounding the results. So if you could perhaps expand a bit more on, on on how that how that was set up. Yes. Okay. So tuber initiation is that so botanically it's the uh, the dormancy starts from tuber initiation. Which is obviously quite difficult to, to to measure. So it's usually estimated from the time of 50% emergence or um, a period of time after 50% emergence. Harvest time is much easier, and so typically many many of the companies will uh, record their dormancy as the period from harvest until their whatever their condition of dormancy break is. But truly, tuber initiation is the, a more accurate term and that allows you to compare year to year, to year much more accurately and site to site. And uh, so, so that's why we've done it from tuber initiation. You're absolutely right about the seed stocks having a significant effect on what the dormancy appears to be. So whether they're physiologically old or, or or not. So we've made some attempt to to do it by ask, asking the various um, representatives of companies that are supplying seed into us to give us good, firstly good crop, they don't all know physiological age for example, and, and crop of a certain size, so the seed tubers of a certain size. So we've done the best that we can to to remove some of those factors, but they inevitably will still be there um, to some extent. Okay, th thanks, Glyn, for, for for that point of clarification on on dormancy. Um, we've had some of the questions come in around um, the temporary MRL for for CIPC. So, um, Adrian, if if perhaps you could cover those. Um, when does the temporary MRL um, take over from uh, from the existing uh, the existing one? So 
sorry. Um, as far as temporary MRO is concerned, that is still going through the European Scope of, um committees, and therefore we do not have any uh, fixed dates for uh, its introduction yet. The, I understand that the next um, discussion on the temporary MRL, uh, which we think will be in the region of uh, 0.4 mg per kilo, possibly 0.3 mg per kilo, um, we expect that to be discussed at the SCOPAF meeting, which I think is on the 28th and 29th of September. So uh, thereafter, there could be an announcement uh, from the European uh, Commission uh, on that uh, temporary MRL. It, it's, it's still going through the process at the moment. So we, um, and until the new temporary MRL comes out, then uh, it remains at uh, the existing level. Okay, so there was an, uh, another question on the uh, thing that you've just uh, answered on the, uh, yeah, le like what this value could be, you know, for this slightly temporary um, MRL plus IPC, but um, I think you've you've covered this. And we've had um, another question come in. Um, was an official extension case for CIPC made uh, to regulators? And if so, what was uh, its outcome? Again, for you, um, Adrian. I, I think there, there have been a number of uh, different uh, meetings um, between stakeholders and CRD, um, but at no time has there been uh, any uh, option to um, reverse the, the loss of approval of CIPC uh, that went through on the 8th of January, um, to my knowledge. So uh, um, I don't think that. Uh, that case is, if it has been put, has not been successful because um, there have been um, overriding factors that came through as part of that uh, review. And um, going back to the um, storage uh, trials that you presented, Glyn, um, on the monitoring of spark controlling in general within this trial, um, are there any assessments being made uh, specifically looking at internal sprouting or internal defects within the on ongoing uh, storage trials and body of work at Sutton Bridge? No, we haven't done we haven't done that in the first year, and I'll be looking. We will look at a, a sub. A subset of the samples for internal defects this year. Okay. Um, perhaps moving on to, we've had some questions come in around store um, management. So I think that's one for you, for you Adrian. Um, with the ceiling of stores becoming more important, what is the maximum um, CO2 concentration that you would um, allow or you would recommend before you uh, would suggest uh, venting? Uh, I think I'd be looking at um, a value around about 5,000 ppm, um, half a percent. Remember we're talking about fresh fresh um, stores here. Um, so uh, I, that's the sort of level I would be looking at. Okay. And we've um, We've had a question come in so slightly um, as a uh, as a side line. We've we've talked about Sutton Bridge and and the 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 future of uh, storage research um, within the UK. I wondered whether we could have um, um, Rob Clayton come coming to join us um, around the the future of Sutton Bridge and, and perhaps clarify. Um, what is the landscape like, and what is the um, what, what is the position of uh, of the board on on this? I'm hoping you can see me now. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you, Rob. Uh, yeah, right. Excellent. Good. Um, yeah. So. Uh, just to bring everyone up to date then, we started um, as a board looking at um, potential um, uh, future for, for storage research in the round. Okay, so, so this is uh, um, bigger than, than just Sutton Bridge and it always has been if you think about people like Bob Pringle and, you know, there, there's been people over the years doing, doing storage research all over the place. Um, um, 
what where the position we got to as a board um was that that we recognized that um i i'm afraid to say that that some of, some of our colleagues are getting on a little bit as we all are um and we need to start thinking about succession planning and things like that um and that's part of the equation um and we, we've always um whilst we've tried to put succession into sutton bridge over the years it's always been difficult because um um it it, it attracts um the attractiveness um, is a little bit different to some of the bigger university towns and some of the research institutes where where um, young scientists really want to be these days. So, so we've we've built in succession as part of it. Um, we've also thought about the the types of funding we get from the uh, like BBSRC and 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 um, other funding sources. Um, and we find because because Sutton Bridge is quite constrained in its size, we we don't get access to the same same pots of money. Um, we, we put the, the storage agenda absolutely first in our list of priorities because we know that's that's the single most important thing the industry has to has to get right um, at the moment. Um, and we also start to think about new technologies and genomics and um, diagnostics and all, all sorts of things that our, um, research institutes are looking at. Um, what we did was we we've we've started to open up a conversation around the research community just to look at the options um of, of how we're you know how we take the storage agenda forwards recognizing it's important recognizing that we need we need the people there um to be able to deliver for us um and at this stage we're we're just waiting on uh, on their responses under a formal tender process so 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 i can't reveal any details from from how that process is going but um you know by the end of the summer um we'll be in a, a much better um position to know exactly what it is they've said how they've reacted um to the tender and and what have you um i think probably the the um the reassuring thing i can say at this stage is we we've We've not actually guided them on saying, do you use Sutton Bridge, don't use Sutton Bridge, do think about the staff, don't think about the staff, um, have this sort of partnership or or this other sort of partnership. So so there's a, actually quite a lot of those things are are still open. Um, we'll get to a point where we'll look at the options that have been presented to us. Um, they will go um, uh, back in front of our board at some point this autumn, um, and we'll start to see if we can, we can go into um, into a next phase of this but i i think the 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 reassurance at the moment is is we've not actually said anything about um what that future looks like we're trying to keep as open a mind as possible um so that we get the best deal possible for our levy pairs thank you very much rob for for um, uh, these points of clarification and uh, i think if people um want to find out more they can uh, get in touch with you directly can't they yeah, we're all ears at the moment. We're we're actually encouraging people. If if anybody wants to just drop me a line, drop me a note, um, we can have a broader conversation about this. Um, and we're also planning to do something a little bit more public around our next board meeting. So um, uh, people will get the opportunity to dial into that at some point during the day, um, and we can have a, a bit more of an open and transparent discussion about um, about all these issues. Thanks, Rob. Thanks very much for that. Um, so to to go back to the topic of the day, I think we'll take uh, one last uh, one last question on on costs, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap things up. Um, but if um, if you do have any further questions, we'll uh, we'll follow follow up um, individually. So um, rest assured that you'll 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 get some answers to to your questions. So one last question around um, any indication on how uh, DMN costs might compare to current products. Um, Adrian, perhaps you could answer that one. Um, I, I, all I can tell you is that I, I, I've been given some uh, indicative costs from uh, its use in Europe and it, uh, uh, it, it is priced on a par with, with, with some of the other products that I've, that I've put up on the, my slide so uh, um it's, it's certainly not as cheap as cipc um but it uh it, it is going to be on a par with, with some of the other alternatives okay so well i i think we'll um we'll stop there for uh for for today with the with the questions 
Um, but if I could perhaps um, wrap things up with a with a poll, we've got a uh, a poll for uh, for for everybody. Um, if we could have the poll live, great. So um, based on the information that you've you've heard from from Andy, uh, Glyn, and Adrian today. Um, do you know which smart expression you'll be using in the 2021 uh, season? So there's uh, several options there that you can select from, which uh, uh, we'll we'll have heard a bit more on um, today. So we'll we'll leave it just under a, a, a minute to get the answers in, and then we'll uh, we'll have a, um, a a brief wrap up on um, on the results. Okay, I think we can uh, close the poll now and we could get the results. I think we've gone back to the presentation. I can give you the results, um, Laura, I can see them. Um, oh, go for it, go for it, Adrian. Uh, Thirty-seven percent malic hydroxide, seventeen percent mint oil, twenty percent ethylene, seven percent no chemical, twenty percent one in five, one in five of you still undecided. So uh, there's still some decision making to to be to be made. Okay, that's great. That's that's uh, really interesting to 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 see those um, see those differences there and. Um, hopefully, for those that are, are undecided, um, you, you know there, there is a lot of material um, and a lot of knowledge uh, within uh, Seven Bridge as well to to help and, and support you through uh, through this decision making. Uh, if we could have our last uh, few few slides, please. So, the, as I said, you know we've got resources um, and, and support available for for you and. Um, uh, really what I highly recommend um, is for you to go and visit the potato storage hub. We have a lot of information on there um, from the, you know, the, the results of the trial, the storage trials that you'll have heard from today. Um, the, all of the information is on there as well as the best, best, practice, best practice around storage advice. Um, you can also keep up to date and receive regular news by signing up to our storage bulletin. Um, and that comes out on a monthly basis, and you can sign up on the storage hub uh, on the storage hub again. And uh, there is also um, experts uh, available. You heard from uh, Adrian Cunnington and, and Lynn Harper um, at Sutton Bridge, uh, as well as Andy, um, uh, Glenn and Adrian, as well as uh, the other experts. Um, at Southern Bridge are available through the storage advice line, which is for charge to levy payers. And uh, as Adrian mentioned, you can uh, register your interest for one-to-one -one visits from the storage network, um, and, and these will resume at the beginning of, uh, of July. Um, so yeah, uh, please make sure to go back to watch previous storage webinars as well. We've had one on store cleaning and I know we had uh, some questions on store cleaning. So please, um, please make sure to uh, have a watch. There's a, a lot of useful information there. And finally, to wrap things up, I know we've um, four, four minutes over time, so we won't keep you in any, any, any further. Um, your feedback is really valuable to us, so uh, please, if you could fill in the survey that should um, pop, on, pop up on your screen as soon as the webinar is is finished, that would be really useful, and we'll we'll make sure to um, uh, bring your comments on on board. As I said at the beginning, the webinar is 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 recorded, so uh, you'll get a link to that, and and it will be available on AHCP's website and YouTube channel as well. And uh, finally, if you do have any further questions, um, my contact details are there. And as I said, we'll follow up individually for any uh, uh, questions that we weren't able to take uh, to take live uh, today. 
And uh, we do have uh, some more exciting webinars uh, coming up, particularly the Potato uh, Showcase uh, Week uh, next week. Uh, my colleagues within the KE team have, have done a fantastic work of putting this program uh, together. So if, if you go on the events website, um, uh, you'll, you'll have the registration links um, there and, and, and we have different topics uh, available um, next week. So thank you very much uh, on behalf of our delegates. Um, thank you very much to our speakers, uh, Adrian, Glyn, Andy and, and Robert as well. Thank you very much for your input. And uh, thank you very much to our attendees for, for joining us. Uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Sure.